This is C-SPAN's Afterwards podcast. This week, CBS News Major Garrett and Center for Election Innovation and Research founder David Becker discuss their book, The Big Truth. They address the allegations of voter fraud in the 2020 election and rebuilding confidence in American democracy. And on this one other point about the recounts never undertaken. Yes, you have to pay, but as, it, as importantly, you have to accept the results. You have to pay and accept the results. Former President Trump never paid because he would have had to accept the results. If you accept the results, you take three states off the map. And this ends. They're interviewed by political national investigative correspondent Heidi Persbilla. Well, first of all, thank you so much as a journalist for writing this, because after reading it, I felt like this is really a definitive document on the big truth of what happened in 2020. And you say you were writing it for the great ideological middle, that includes journalists. Uh, But the beginning of it really begins with a chilling conclusion that you make about being on the precipice of a potential second civil war. Tell me about that, and what are the warning signs that you're seeing? So we don't make a prediction about another civil war, but we do explain, we hope vividly, that there are psychic forces loose in our country that create not just volatility, but the potential for deep and permanent estrangement. We don't talk about a civil war of the kind we read about or see in movies like Gettysburg or others, where there are bullets and bayonets and hundreds of thousands of die. We don't talk about a civil war like that. We talk about a civil war that is one of gradual, rhetorical, and procedural separation. A national divorce. A national divorce that is procedural, again, rhetorical. It's a cleaving of the sense of union, of us as Americans identifying with one another and on behalf of foundational, not only truths, but institutions. And we describe that process starting over a disagreement about what actually happened in this upcoming midterm election. And I won't go into too many details, because I want people to read the book and buy the book and see it for themselves, judge it for themselves. But David and I thought about how could this happen. And I think you'll agree with us, Heidi, that what we present is not very far from the actual reality we are experiencing right now, uh, where poll workers in certain jurisdictions are given more latitude than they had before. There are many open carry states in this country in which people who are observing the election process can and will be armed in full accordance with the law. There could be a disagreement that, because no one really wants it to, but nevertheless becomes very intense, and something accidental happened. We don't talk about an intentional premeditated act of violence, but we talk about something springing forth that has unpredictable, bloody, and deadly consequences. And then the nation looking at it horror, and then one political party saying, okay, we cannot look away from this. We must do something in reaction to it. And that thing sets off a chain of events which creates this divorce, this permanent cleaving of America as we know it, and creates something divided and unrecognizable. And the way that you laid it out, David, was so logical and plausible that it was kind of terrifying. And I, I, I don't want to give away the book, but there are so many examples in here. I think if maybe if you just give me one, it, it might help people understand just how easy this is. And, and for instance, um, states withholding revenue from the federal right. government. I, I mean, one of the things that we put a lot of thought into was how many different ways this could come about. And by the way, this is not inevitable. I mean, one of the key lessons of this book, we hope, but in the rest of the book is that there are, there are ways, there's a, there are pathways out of this that all of us can engage in. But um, whether it's through a, and a provocative act in a particular polling place or through several smaller acts like we're seeing in, um, in Arizona or in Nevada or in other places... What we're seeing is that the election deniers want us all to be scared of voting, which I'm very concerned about because voting is very, very safe in this country. Um, And they want us to doubt outcomes of elections in which they lose. And we have become so accustomed to 
the idea that our fellow citizens are not our fellow citizens who we might disagree with on some things, but rather our enemies, our mortal enemies in some cases, our neighbors, our family members, our friends who are the people actually running elections in these places. We're relying upon hundreds of thousands of them this year. Um, that they could be involved in a massive conspiracy that nobody is talking about. Um, because a lot of them are leaving. Yeah, a lot of them are right? leaving. We're seeing rates as high as 50% in some states of, of experienced election professionals, both parties. And in some ways, Republicans are experiencing it worse than Democrats um, all over the country. So that's happening. And in that environment, you could start getting to the point pretty quickly where either as a political leader or as a citizen, you could start saying, I, I don't want to be a part of this, other, uh, of this other part of the country. I don't want to be related to them. I don't want to be connected to them. By the way, we already see the seeds of this being planted. I mean, shipping migrants from a border state to another state with whom you politically disagree, that's not what the union was meant to deal with. The union, if, if anything, was meant to protect our common borders and to deal with it collectively as a, as a country. Um, and you could see this happening on either side of the political spectrum, that we get to the point where we just decide, I, I can't be associated with them. So do we start untethering ourselves, unraveling ourselves from them economically. You know, there are many, many states that give a dollar fifty, a dollar thirty to the federal government for every dollar they get back. They could start rationalizing it that way. We rely upon interstate commerce in so many ways, and that could start being affected in many ways. And so, you know, again, this is not inevitable, this is not a prediction, but it's something we're concerned about. We raise in the book already disagreements between states over abortion. Mm-hmm. There are billboards in several states, Texas, Mississippi, and Alabama, sponsored by the state of California, saying, if you need an abortion, we're here to help. That is one state going to another state and saying, your laws are unrecognizable to us. We have different laws, and we will rescue your citizens from your state because of this disagreement over a law. such a good observation, especially with Congress effectively and so not governing the states cleaving on, be, on issues. And this idea of boycotting, of states feeling so separate from one another, that this can be a revenue thing. One state could say, we're not going to give our federal revenue to Washington anymore, and we dare you to come try to collect it. We are freeing our citizens from that obligation. Come here, federal government, and see how well you are equipped, because we really suspect you're not to collect this federal revenue, then like-minded states say, you know what, that state's on to something. We're going to do the same thing. And then states that don't agree with that say, we're no longer going to recognize the commercial or travel or citizenship rights of those renegade states. This could have a propulsive dynamic to it that we write the book intentionally to scare people just a little bit and say, these are psychic forces. You can't deny that they exist, but there is a way back. And I just want to note, I mean, we talk about this in the book, about the Attorney General of Texas, Ken Paxton. He filed a lawsuit in the United States Supreme Court in December of 2020 under their original jurisdiction. For people who don't know what that means, that means that the United States Supreme Court will sit as a trial court in a case between states. And what Texas and other Republican attorney generals said was that we don't like the election rules in other states. And so we're going to challenge those election rules in those other states. Just think about how unconservative or anti-federalist that idea is. And imagine what those same Republican attorneys general would have said if the attorneys general of California, Illinois, and Massachusetts had tried to do the same thing in 2016. And remember, this is also over a month after the election that they already knew the rules about. And the words you use in the book are that our nation has been sick before, but it has healed. We've been through a lot of tumult in our history, the Vietnam War, slavery... Uh, We've had much closer elections, the strife of the 1960s. But the one thing that's different, and this is what I want you to talk about now, is that we've never had such an organized attempt to discredit and undermine our election system. Talk a little bit about that and why this moment is different, why you're so concerned about this moment. We, we We have a lot of disagreements in this country, and that's not unusual. But the way that we resolve those disagreements is through the ballot box and our elected representatives. And never before have we had a coordinated, continuous attack on that very process, on that process of how we resolve our disagreements. 
we need a basis to resolve our disagreements. Every democracy does. That basis relies upon the consent of the governed and the rule of law in the United States of America and any successful democracy. And we are seeing consistent attacks on both of them to the point where many Americans no longer believe that an election was secure or valid if their side didn't win. We, in 1960, Vice President Nixon undoubtedly believed, whether he had evidence for it or not, that in the one state that decided the Electoral College that year, Illinois, there might have been fraud. There was no evidence of it. There's disagreement over whether it existed. But he presided over the joint session of Congress that elected his opponent in that presidential election. And he did so out of a sense of duty. Vice President Gore obviously did the exact same thing in 2000. Both of those elections were decided by one state. Both of them were very close and much closer than what we had in 2020. And as we point out in 2020, 2020 was actually not a very close election, at least in terms of modern history. And it's the largest margin of victory of any presidential election in the 21st century where Barack Obama wasn't on the ballot. Over 7 million votes, a difference in the, in the popular vote, a minimum of three states in the Electoral College. And all of those states had margins over 10,000 votes. Now, that seems narrow, but election lawyers like myself will tell you in the in the era of recounts and audits and other things that can be done, 10,000 votes is a landslide. There's never been a statewide election anywhere in the United States overturned with greater than 1,000 votes margin. So very different than 2,000, and we've never seen this kind of continuous attack. We're over 725 days from the 2020 election, and those attacks continue, and they've led to threats and harassment of our professional politi- uh, public servants, our election officials all over the country, and those threats are only growing. So it feels like the big lie is winning out over the big truth. I, what did you? I'm sure, sorry. it it certainly feels that way in certain sectors of the country, and I know and I can sense for the viewing audience some are saying, "Well, haven't Democrats mm-hmm. questioned elections before?" Answer: Yes, we write about it in every instance that is part of our modern political conversation. Two thousand, we go into it. We talk to one of the litigating attorneys involved in the two thousand election to go back and refresh our memory and everyone's memory about that. That was a true dispute over voter intent and ballot design. And plenty of courts said there are legitimate questions here that need to be resolved and the law is hard to work out. And it was a stressful... The few hundred vote difference. Right. 537 (laughs) and ballot design and voter intent. Did voters actually vote for someone who they mistakenly because of the ballot design? That was a question that deserved to be litigated. And it was a difficult process. So Democrats, yes, raised questions about that, as did Republicans. 2004, a small number of Democrats raised objections about one state, Ohio. 2016, there were lots of unhappy Democrats who wondered if that election was legit, raised questions about it. Stacey Abrams raised questions about the Georgia gubernatorial race in 2018. We describe all of that. But not one of those Democrats found, with the exception of Stacey Abrams, who was a nominee, a nominee who would endorse that. John Kerry didn't in 2004. Al Gore accepted the ultimate ruling of the Supreme Court. And none of them stormed the Capitol. And none of them raised money and grifted and grifted and grifted, proposing wilder and wilder and wilder new conspiracy theories to explain something that never happened because the last theory that they just propounded has been clearly debunked. That's one of the daisy change processes here that aggravates David and I. Because it never ends. There's always another explanation. Even the most current one, which is about drop boxes. That's not where this started. That's like the 20th iteration. And when you have 20 iterations of one supposed crime, you have to ask yourself logically, how could that possibly be? Answer, it can't. And... What aboutism is deeply dangerous in this particular conversation? David and I are very emphatic about this. The answer to election denialism is not more election denialism, because it will only end wickedly and irretrievably for this country. It does not feel like we're in that space right now. And I'm going to ask you a question that I can't answer, but I get asked all the time, Mm -hmm. which is why? Why are we at this point when, as you outline in your book, there have been so many other moments in our history when we've been on the precipice of a great national cleaving or national divorce, as you put it. Mm -hmm. And 
I'm going to give you a provocative question about that, which you cite in the book um, from Representative Jamie Raskin, who observes that throughout our history, when we've had big demographic changes, that has never occurred without violence and upset. I'm not saying or suggesting that is the main factor at play here, but is it a factor? And why? Again, why now? I mean, I'll let Major talk a little bit about this because he's been covering the, the, um, the phenomenon that surrounded Trump over many years. But I also think um, we have an incentive structure that's out of whack right now. Um, it, it is, we're, we're facing some difficult times, and there might be some difficulties that normally come along with that. But unlike the um, original sin of slavery that we had to get past during the Civil War, or the ongoing issues related to the civil rights movement of the Vietnam War, where there were real substantive divisions. The issues of whether our elections are secure, that's not at issue in the country. That's all a lie. Our elections are more secure than they've ever been. We talk about this in the book. We have more paper ballots than we've ever had that are verified by the voters and we can go back to and recount and audit. 95% of all voters voted on paper in 2020. It was only about 75 to 80% in 2016. The entire state of Georgia had no paper ballots in 2016, all paper ballots in 2020. Pennsylvania was mostly non-paper in 2016, all paper in 2020. We audited all of those ballots. We had more pre-election litigation clarifying the rules, more post-election litigation that confirmed the results. So the underlying system works, but the lies are still there, and people are profiting off of them. And I want to get to that. Yeah. I do want to get to that. About a half a billion dollars Donald Trump has already raised off of this in the past two years. And they are gaining political power. It might be temporary, but they're gaining political power off of these lies. And we have to do something about that incentive structure. We talk a little bit about that in the book I'm not going to let you go on this just yet because we know that the lies are being told. And early on in this phenomenon, a good Republican source of mine said, Heidi... As you go about reporting, I want you to make sure to distinguish between the liars and the lied to. And there are many, Mm -hmm. many smart attorneys, political consultants, and other uh, elite in the party who must know that these are lies about our election Mm -hmm. system. So I ask you once again, why are they incentivized to tell these lies? Is it a fear of loss of place, of loss of culture um so why there's a there's a very direct answer to that in terms of their ability to hold on to their job and their political power this is a highly motivating issue within republican primary electorates and there's a way that political strategists count likely voters you know this very well four four three four two four one four zero four the higher you are, close to that number four, the more likely you are to vote. So most campaigns build their strategy around four, four, three, four, and two, four voters. Why am I going through this? Because the big lie is a motivating factor that turns out zero, four voters who have never showed up and one, four voters who show up maybe once every eight years. And Republicans don't know any other way to keep their job than to try to satisfy these voters that will come in unexpected numbers in primary contests to send this message. And they will not wage the battle to talk them out of it because they have learned or they assume, maybe they haven't learned, but they assume that if they try, they will have, they will suffer the political equivalent of a metaphorical stoning. And you've seen that with reporting out of Capitol Hill from Republicans who speak privately, who voted to decertify the election, who because said they, it's because my people want me to do that. Well, well, but realize this is also, this is a minority rule strategy. This is, a, this is a basically a concession that they'll never get the majority. I mean, in, in campaign after campaign around the country, the election deniers who won primaries were the weaker of the Republican candidates or having difficulty in elections that probably Republicans should win easily. And in fact, you know, Democrats agree with them on this point because they supported some of these candidates in the primaries thinking they would be the weaker candidates. And um, ultimately, you know, I think the question is, is this a rational strategy as morally depraved as it might be? Mm -hmm. 
or is it an irrational strategy? I don't know if we agree on this. We haven't talked about this much. I actually happen to think it's an irrational strategy long term um, because we might not have a democracy much longer that even a minority can rule. Um, But a minority rule strategy, I think back to the Reagan administration. And people forget the 1980 election was actually much closer than people remember because we remember the 1984 election, which was a complete rout. Um, And if someone had told Ronald Reagan that he could get elected losing the popular vote but winning the Electoral College and that was the strategy to pursue, I feel fairly confident Ronald Reagan would have ushered that person out of the office pretty quickly and said, that's not what we're going to do. He got hammered in the 1982 midterms. Um, That used to be something both parties just rejected. And now it seems to be kind of the core strategy of one party, that we are going to attempt minority rule because we don't see a path forward with our base to achieve majority rule. And that path forward, of course, actually requires them to tell the majority of their party what might be difficult for them to hear, which is that we lost an election. More voters voted for the other side. We should be resetting and fighting out the next election. Now, there is a structural parallel. If you go back to the Gilded Age, the massive transformation from an agriculture economy to an industrial economy, that's basically late 19th century, early 20th century. That was a time of massive economic, cultural, and social dislocation. People felt dislodged from an understood way of life. Things were hurtling at them in ways that were completely unexpected and they were unprepared for. That created a great instability in American politics. Congressional majorities swung back and forth radically at that period of time. We also had a deeply embedded partisan press. Parties either owned, county, county parties owned newspapers, candidates owned papers, governors owned newspapers, and that partisan press attacked the opponent and protected the political figure. Does any of that sound familiar to what we're going through now? And a sense of voters constantly looking for someone who had answers about this great set of dislodging and disrupting external factors created tremendous volatility and a kind of alienation in our politics. All of that is present now. But the one big difference is you have one person, and you really can't separate any of this from former President Trump. He is the person who is given this rhetorical rage and continues to farm that rage among voters who cannot believe, despite a preponderance of evidence, he would deceive them on this topic. He is, and they are being deceived. And that is pivoting to my next question about the most important big truths on the chance that some of these folks are watching Uh, Hopefully they will buy your book, Uh, but if they don't, if there are just a few big truths that you feel from this book they need to walk away with, what are they? I mean, what we try to do, the the election deniers would like those defending the election to play an endless game of whack-a-mole, where the same made-up stories about suitcases of ballots or bamboo ballots keep having to be whacked down and then they pop up again. We try to tell the positive story about the 2020 election, which is somehow the men and women, the professionals who run elections, Republicans and Democrats all over the country, somehow manage the highest turnout in American history, more than 20 million more voters than we'd ever seen, two-thirds of all eligible voters, which we've never seen in a century. Manage that all in the middle of a global pandemic. They couldn't plan elections socially distant. They were literally having to meet with their staffs in offices. Some of them were getting sick. And they somehow manage this with unprecedented scrutiny and vitriol being directed at them. And that's the real story of the 2020 election. I talked about this already. We know the 2020 election was the most secure ever. Um, Not only did we hear this from the Trump's own Department of Homeland Security and Trump's own FBI and Trump's own Department of Justice, but we've got the documents to prove it. We've got the paper ballots and the audits and the court decisions that prove it. And there's other evidence that even the election deniers know this is true. Donald Trump had an absolute legal right to recounts in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania under those states' laws. Um, We might remember in 2016, Jill Stein took advantage of those opportunities and had recounts in all three states, and they all confirmed the results. Donald Trump did win the 2016 election by winning a majority of votes in states that comprised a majority of the uh, Electoral College. I said so at the time, and the evidence confirms it. In 2020, Donald Trump had that same right. He requested statewide recounts in none of those three states. And in fact, every single member of Congress who objected 
to the electoral count was elected on the very same paper ballots that gave them the authority to object to those electoral ballots, electoral votes. I mean, you can't make this stuff up, but if you think about it, I, I mean, I, I talk about this all the time. I, I've worked in elections for 25 years. We don't have one national election. We have 10,000 little elections at any given point in time. Everything leading up to November 8th this year is 10,000 little jurisdictional elections. And in order to steal a national election of any kind, you would need a conspiracy of millions of people all over the country, half of whom are from the other party, and have none of them talk. It's not possible. And so this whole thing is based on the big lie, and there is an affirmatively good story to tell about the 2020 election. It is, it is the greatest success of American democratic process in history, and we should be celebrating it. You know, in focus groups with Trump supporters, they talk about how they became Trump supporters and aggravated with what is existing in America from their perspective. And frequently they will say, first I was sad, now I'm mad. Sad about either economy or the border or crime or other things that they feel aren't the way they ought to be. To those, I would say there is something to be happy about. I really mean this. Elections in this country are not a federal responsibility. They're a local responsibility. When you go to your precinct, you see your neighbors. My mother was a poll worker for 25 years, in addition to being an executive for at and in the 60s and 70s, something highly unusual for a woman in this country. But she took work, time off from work to be a poll worker. She did that so she could keep track of the neighborhood. She was a busy person and to fulfill a civic duty. Be happy about what American democracy actually means in terms of how we do it. Yes, there are election administrators and professionals, but there are hundreds of thousands of volunteers, and they're your neighbors who do this work, not because they're going to be paid a lot, not because they're going to be prestigious, not because they're going to get a parade or an award or be on a ladder climb to political power. None of those things are going to happen. And they're not interested in any of those things. You know what they're interested in? The core values of this country. The things that maybe you're sad and then mad about. No, not in this space. That is something to take pride in. Because it's working. Our elections, to David's earlier point, are better than they've ever been. They're more verified, they're more verifiable, they're more resilient, they're more accessible. All of those things are not accidents. There isn't something by which someone in Washington pours out a little potion, drops in a couple of drops of water, and this whole national thing opens up. No, it's mutual agreement in small town after small town after small town, large cities, exurbs, suburbs, rural areas, where by common agreement, we work on behalf of the continuance of our American democratic experiment. I urge you, if you're mad about lots of things, don't be mad about that. Take pride in it. Be happy about that and let that truth sink in because it's not going to go away unless you take a hand and trying to destroy it. And Major, I, I love that you're speaking directly to these folks who you're trying to speak to in, in the book as well. And one thing that you both did in here that I hadn't seen before and that I think is so important was the um, sympathy and kindness that you showed to some of the victims, as you call them, of the big lie. Mm -hmm. And there are many, whether it's in the form of financial penalties, people who are, are serving jail time, uh, due to the insurrection, who believe that Donald Trump told them to go there and got mm -hmm. caught up in it. Talk a little bit about those people and why it's important not to brush their stories and their apologies under the carpet. Yeah, there, there were 74 million people who voted for former President Trump in the last election. They're not all insurrectionists. They're not all violent. They're, not, they're mostly good Americans. They preferred another candidate. That's in the great American tradition. Um, 
And they are the natural targets for the lie, the lie that is lining the pockets of the grifters that are spreading that lie. Um, they are incentivized, the grifters, to keep these people angry and divided from their fellow Americans so that they can keep getting those $25 contributions, those $30 um, uh, fees to watch a fake documentary, the entry fees to go see a rally. That's all lining someone's pockets. You know, the people who are targeting their businesses, their entire, their, their entire uh, commerce at, at these individuals. And it must be really hard to live in a media bubble like that and be hearing that your democracy is being stolen from you. You can only imagine what kind of behavior that could justify. This doesn't absolve that behavior. People who committed criminal acts absolutely should be prosecuted and serve time. But it must be very difficult, and I think we both do have a lot of sympathy for people who are constantly hearing your democracy is being stolen. Imagine any of us hearing that. And I do see this to some degree across the political spectrum. This is not a 50-50 thing. This is not moral equivalence. This is coming almost entirely from an extremist part of the right wing right now. But it's not 100 to 0. There are some kernels of this growing on the other end of the political spectrum. And we all have to be very, very wary of that, that there are people who want to keep us angry. I heard the term, this term recently, rage farming. Mm-hmm. There are people who are getting mm-hmm. rich off of farming our rage, and that just struck home for me. Okay, but a lot of the farmers haven't been punished. Right, it seems not yet. What's happening not is yet. that the people on the bottom who but are there, co-opted, but there, if you want to say. But there are means by which accountability, and accountability is often slow in this space, very slow. There will be some political accountability. Some people who deny the election will lose in large part because of that. Some will win, but many will lose. There's also an accountability in the legal sphere. There are lawsuits going on against those who knowingly said false things about Dominion and Smart Tech. Those two companies are suing. They've made it very clear in court documents that they're wide open to discovery of their systems. But those who spread lies are reluctant to have similarly pervasive discovery of what they knew and how it conflicted dramatically quite likely, with what they actually said. That's a form of accountability. There are those who've been identified in a particular documentary who are suing that documentary over making false statements about what they did with their own ballot. That's a long-running process. Accountability will be slow, but it will, we believe, be achieved and over time send a message that this is not a space that is free of consequences. It may create profit. It may create momentary political gains. But it is not a long game because the facts that we talk about in this book are not going anywhere. People need to understand that there is this motivation, um, incentive structure here. So uh, tell me a little bit more about the grifting because it's real. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, this look, it, it began... I mean, it actually began before 2016, the seeds of this, and it went through the Trump administration to some degree. We probably remember the Presidential Advisory Commission on Election Integrity, which was monopartisan and was kind kind of gamed from the beginning to yield a certain result. And even with all of those resources and all of that gaming by the administration, they still couldn't find a single case of fraud. They still couldn't find any evidence that this was a problem. Um, And then, of course, in 2020, we saw this beginning from early on that President Trump and others were delegitimizing ways we've been voting for centuries. Mail voting, which we've been using since at least the Civil War, that Republican legislatures had really um, taken the lead on in places like Utah and Arizona, um, and which Republican campaigns had relied upon much more effectively than Democratic campaigns, actually. Because if you think about it, mail voting is most likely to be used by older voters and property owners. And Republicans perceive that to be a core part of their base. So they had used it very effectively in many places. So this grift continued. And this grift, you know, was designed to lay the foundation for if President Trump lost, he could claim that the election was rigged. And we saw this in messaging throughout the election of 2020. And even going back to August of 2016, at least when he was spreading these lies. And after the election and after January 6th and after the inauguration on January 20th, we see a real effort to monetize these efforts. 
I mean, they were consistently sending text messages and going out on social media, making claims that they were unwilling to make in court, that they knew would get hammered in court if they subjected them to scrutiny, but they could make on social media and drive a ton of small dollar donations. The documentary we're talking about, which we're not going to mention by name because it is completely made up and has actually been, it's actually (laughs) been, it it, it refers to a beast of burden. We'll just say that. Um, But it's literally been referred to the FBI and the IRS and the makers of it for fraud by the Republican Attorney General in the state of Arizona, who was a candidate for Senate in this past primary election. Um, It was recently, the makers of this were recently referred to, referred for contempt by a Reagan-appointed judge in Texas. So this grift is ongoing, but they know they can collect these dollars. And we've seen evidence from places like Open Secrets that, I mean, Trump himself has raised about a half a billion dollars off of this. And we are sympathetic in this space, Heidi. We really are. I went through a lot of the letters that people who have been arrested and were awaiting adjudication for storming the Capitol. And you published some of them in here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, because they're open documents. They were submitted to the court. And we've gotten some blowback from some progressives who are like, I don't have any sympathy for these people. They committed a crime. They're criminals. And I'm like, hold on. Read these letters in which they say, I never believe, and I'm not quoting them directly, but the spirit of them is, I never believed that someone would tell me a lie about this and I got caught up in it and it's the biggest mistake of my life and I wish I had never done it now you could say well they're just trying to get a lighter sentence and they'll say anything to a judge maybe that's true but when I started my career I was a police reporter I've got what I like to think is a somewhat sophisticated crap detector (laughs) these read to me like letters of people who had taken a journey And I do feel sympathy for them because at one core level, they thought they were doing something right. To David's point, they were told this election was stolen and you have an obligation to protect our democracy. And they thought, well, I think that's right. I do have an obligation. I'm an American. Look, at at a passionate level, that's sort of a, I'm part of this story of this country level, I get that. And their journey was, oh my gosh. I had real feelings, but I wasn't being told the truth. I was manipulated. I wish I hadn't been. They go into great detail about how sorry they are about the people who were injured, the police officers especially, the trauma that the congressional staff and others experience, and their sense of disbelief that they could ever get to that place. I have genuine, genuine compassion for them. And we write about it for a specific reason, because those journeys are not invented. And like you said, there's all sorts of victims. That would be a more dramatic example of people who might even be serving jail time. Mm -hmm. But there's the grift victims. Mm -hmm. And um, I want to ask you, how much of that money, because millions and millions of dollars were raised on the false pretense that there was a fraudulent election that needed to be litigated and millions of dollars were raised by individuals who were close to the president as well as the president himself. How much of that was actually used towards fighting fraud? Well, helpfully in the book, we quote Patrick Byrne, former CEO of Overstock.com, who says in his own book, which we read in preparation for our book, none of it was spent. And that all these Republicans who sent all their money in, thinking that they were going to help stop the steal, were, his word, not mine, not David's, fleeced. Fleeced. That's not Major Garrett saying fleeced. That's not David Becker saying fleeced. That's Patrick Byrne, who wrote a book saying he believes the election was stolen. His theories, long since debunked, but on this particular quite heavy question, those are his words. Yeah, and I, I, I should say, I mean, I remember the recounts I mentioned that Donald Trump had available to him in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. Estimates are that would have cost a little bit under $20 million to request. And the evidence makes clear that he had raised about $200 million during that time. He would have had to pay less than one-tenth, a dime on the dollar of the money that he had raised to have 
to go through the legal recourse of getting recounts in these states, which had all paper ballots and were ready to do it, were waiting for him to do mm-hmm. it. He didn't spend a dollar on that. They keep saying there's going to be lawsuits brought. Every, you, know, you can't go a week without hearing my pillow guys say there's going to be a lawsuit that's filed that's going to you know, just be mind-blowing. Right. We haven't seen those lawsuits. You know, we're still, we're, st- we're still hearing about these lawsuits that are going to be filed at any point in time, the defamation lawsuits from certain candidates. Trump will be reinstated. Yeah, the reinstatement, which, you know, even some of the election denier supporting legislators have had to make clear in states like Wisconsin, There's that's no not a thing, you know. Um, you, we, we, we can't reinstate someone who lost the election. There were electoral vote slates that were certified, that were delivered by law to the National Archives and had no competing slates that were certified. And they were counted appropriately in a, in a joint session presided over by the losing vice presidential candidate and the sitting vice president. Um, and still, you know, the, the, the degree to which that this grift continues and targets, I mean, they're not targeting Biden voters with this. They're not buying it. They're targeting the sincerely disappointed supporters of the former president. They're the ultimate as, as Major pointed at quoting Patrick Byrne, they're the ones who are getting fleeced. And they are. And, and on this one other point about the recounts never undertaken. Yes, you have to pay, but as, it, as importantly, you have to accept the results. You have to pay and accept the results. Former President Trump never paid because he would have had to accept the results. And if you accept the results, you take three states off the map. And this ends. And that was within his rights, clearly within his financial ability, and clearly would have been consistent with the pledges he was making to those from whom he was raising money. And across the board, I didn't create those facts. David Becker didn't create those facts. Former President Trump created all of those facts. And just as important as the book's message about setting the record straight on 2020 is the warning about certain aspects that have now become embedded into our political culture and even our election system uh, with poll workers who believe the big lie now volunteering in droves. What are the lessons that we should take away and look out for in terms of your biggest concerns going into these midterms now a couple of weeks away? Yeah, I think um, one of my biggest concerns is that the election deniers have a much easier job than those of us, the vast majority of us, who are protecting democracy. Those who are protecting democracy, the majority of Americans, have to protect an entire um, 360-degree aspect of our democracy. And the election deniers only have to pierce one point. And what we see them doing now is they are staging, it's performative, these things that we're seeing in Arizona, the things we're seeing in Nevada, the claims that they're, ra- that they're, they're training an army of observers. And my fear is that, yes, some of that is going to manifest itself. There are going to be some voters who are intimidated. But my fear is that's the goal, that we cover it and make, make voters fear the act of voting fear the act of participating in our democracy. There was a Reuters poll that just came out recently that said 40% of all voters are worried about voter intimidation, when the reality is maybe 40 people will really experience voter intimidation, and the acts of those in Arizona and Nevada and others should be investigated and prosecuted. But for 99.999% of American voters, they're going to find a process that's convenient, that's familiar, and that's safe. And what the election deniers want is for voters to self-suppress for them to lose confidence in their democracy, regardless of who they're voting for. They win in that circumstance. That's a real risk right now for us. And I think, especially in the days leading up to the election, I'm going to be very, very much watching. Okay, so that was my story about the army (laughs) of poll workers exposing that. And while you're right that the concerns are really about voter intimidation, aren't your concerns also, though, that these people, again, are being used as vehicles to um, raise meritless objections, which then could be used by attorneys and folks in the party to mount challenges to elections all over the place. So challenges are one thing. Successful challenges are another. And trust me, David knows this better than I do, but I've gotten a chance to meet and get to know election administrators all over the country. They know they're under intense scrutiny. Um, They are 
doing what they always do, the best work, the preparatory work, and a challenge about something that someone thinks might be suspicious that isn't, won't go very far, point one. It will be harassment, it will be wasted legal fees, wasted attorney's energy, but in the end, the courts will look at it and say, no, they follow the procedures. Or if they didn't, it's a, it's a small thing or it's judiciable, it can be remedied. I, I don't worry about those things structurally because I believe the system is sound and, to our earlier point, better than it's ever been. The one thing I think David and I also have a concern about is because of all this intensity of spirit, let us say diplomatically, about election outcomes, there are going to be a lot of close races in a lot of close states. And the sense that this midterm election is of existential importance, not necessarily true, but lots of people feel it, so what they feel is more true than what's actually true. Your feelings matter in this space. There's going to be anxiety and anticipation for information. And the results are going to be maybe slower than people want. We may not know who controls the House by the end of Tuesday night, Wednesday morning, after Election Day. In some cases, we may not know who won Senate races or governor's races for a couple of days. That doesn't mean anything's wrong. That means we're counting the ballots, we're making sure it's verifiable, making sure it can live up to that scrutiny. But in that space of uncertainty, people could have doubts that become much worse than that. Yeah, And, and, and infect the system with either violence or volatility. And you actually hit on the key point there. I mean, we kind of have to divide this up between what happens from now until November 8th at 8 p.m. and what happens from 8.01 p.m. on. And I have a lot of confidence in the process actually working up through the closing of the polls. Um, we absolutely need to be reporting about efforts to intimidate voters and other things. I relied upon your reporting and others. <laughs> when I, you I, said I, army. No, no, no. <laughs> it, no, it was really, I, I mean, it, it, it's, it's important that we know about this. I talked to the election officials there. They're worried about it. That vigilance is really, really important. Um, but I have a lot of confidence that, you know, we see record early voting in many states, including Georgia right now. Uh, it seems to be racially balanced. It seems to be something that everyone is taking advantage of. Um, but once the polls close, there are going to be efforts to delegitimize the process by, let's face it, losing candidates. The winner has no reason to delegitimize the process. So we should be very, very vigilant for anything candidates who perceive that they're losing, even if they're temporarily winning, as we're counting the ballots normally through a process that we always have. I just saw a tweet from a U.S. senator that criticized that certain party, certain areas controlled by one party take longer to count ballots than others. That is false. We have never counted ballots on election night in this country. It's impossible to count all ballots on election night in this country. We take a time to count the ballots right because it's better to get it accurate than to get it fast. And the only reason we think we know who won elections is because the margins are very large. But in narrow elections, it's going to take us quite some time. It might take us days. It might even take us weeks. California takes among the longest period of time to count ballots in the country. And we never worry about that in a presidential election because we know that California, know who won in California. But there are 52 new congressional districts in that state. And some of them are going to be close. And that could define control of the United States House. And to that point... One of the other big differences that you identify in here compared to our history of close elections and contentious elections is the fact that there is this infrastructure being built in advance, legal infrastructure, versus 2000, for instance, mm -hmm. where nobody could have foreseen that it was going to be that close of an election and be a contested election, well, close, but not contested, and that the legal infrastructure sprang into action as needed in that instance, whereas now... It's being put together in advance in anticipation of potentially just that type of scenario. How worried are you, for instance, about what happened in Otero County, Mexico, with uh, county commissioners just refusing to certify an election until the state Supreme Court said, oh, sorry, you, you got to do that? Yeah, the Otero County situation, I'm glad you brought that up because it really is the model for what could happen in many places around the country. There you had three... Uh, Republican members of the county board who refused to certify the primary. Remember, this wasn't even the general election. This is the primary. Their guys the, won. Yeah, their guys won. The clerk said you have to certify this, the professional election official. And they all three voted not to certify because, and this is a direct quote, they had a gut feeling they, they couldn't trust the machines. The, um, but I think that's also a model of how the legal system can work in this case. 
that the Attorney General, the Secretary of State, the New Mexico Supreme Court acted very, very swiftly, had a writ of mandate saying you have to certify the election. Still one of those three of them, someone who had literally been sentenced for his role in January 6th, at the same period of time refused to, but two of the three did certify the election. I think we're likely to see attempts like that on a larger scale in the general election, particularly when um, uh, election deniers have lost the election. Um, There are two concerns here. One is, is the legal system going to hold up? Is it going to uphold the rule of law and the actual will of the voters? I have much more confidence in that. I think that is going to happen. Um, What I have a great deal of concern about is that takes time. It might be days, it might be weeks, it might be months. But that takes time, and during that time, the grifters can turn up the heat on people's anger, and that will create an environment that's ripe for political violence. And I know in talking to election officials all over the country, they're very worried about this. And it's something we're going to have to keep a close eye on and try to do our best to tamp down that um, that anger and that potential for violence. So let's talk about machines for just a second, because they scan ballots and count the ballots. Then there's the paper record that David talked about. When audits are conducted, you scan a certain percentage to make sure what the machine said is what is representative in the paper ballots. That's a verification process. In Nye County in Nevada, they have decided to not have machines. They want to go back to hand counting of ballots. They're discovering three things, all of which were predictable. One, it's very time-consuming. The people who are doing it are like, I can't believe this takes so long. Two, they've made mistakes. They've had to do recounts because though they are trying to do it correctly, Mm -hmm. human error creeps in. Three, they're exhausted, and they're not even nearly halfway done with this task. That's why we have machines. I would like to suggest to people that the way we count ballots is not dissimilar from the way we scan a FedEx package. It's optically recorded and put into a verified database. The one difference is everything that's at a local office is sealed in that. It's not accessible any other way. But it's more or less the same thing. So I ask you, would you rather deliver your package via FedEx or drive it yourself? Because that's what we're talking about. No, you wouldn't want to drive it yourself. That's why FedEx is a multi-billion dollar global company. Because we hand over things to be scanned and to be moved. It's not a dissimilar process. But you don't drive a package across country to an address you've never been before. Just one second. Yeah. Do you think we need to change the way we articulate to the American people? I'm trying to find like, ways. I'm because really trying to find yes. ways. This, these are basic civic. I'm trying to find of ways to, to, to point, make this more so accessible. Important. To make this more accessible. Well, this is. I mean, the reason we teamed up on this book is because Major has an experience and a skill set that I don't possess. I mean, he's he's a journalist. He's covered campaigns. He knows he knows the Trump effect so well. Um, he's covered the White House. Meanwhile, I, I've devoted my career 25 years to this esoteric little world of election administration, which is so far down in the weeds, you're at the dirt. I mean, it is nuts and bolts. The reason that it's great for people who have doubts to, to volunteer to be a poll worker is they, they soon learn that it's not, you know, you just don't show up and start handing out pieces of paper to people. And I mean, it is a 365 day a year job. And you have to show up, you have to get trained for hours, show up hours before the polls open and stay hours after they close because there are so many checks and balances and redundancies and bipartisan observations that people have to go through. And to be honest, I don't expect everyone to get into the weeds as far as I do. This is my job. But the hand counting thing, and you brought up the challenges, which I think is the key to this. The challenges are all about reducing the guardrails of democracy so that it actually increases the opportunity for losing candidates to try to steal an election or to at least continue the grift, right? Mm -hmm. And hand counting is a great example of that. There is literally no one who's ever run an election who says hand counting is a good idea. I mean, on my ballot, it has 37 different races. It has six pages, and I have one of the shorter ballots in the country. Um, It's impossible to do that and hand count and to get ballots quickly. And one of the other dynamics we see is the same people who are saying hand counting are saying we got to have ballots counted on election night. Those two things don't work together. So we need the election officials have this, and we do need to educate people more 
because what the grifters are trying to do is to create more of an opportunity for them to raise doubt about elections when they lose. You all end the book asking, where do we go from here? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask you that question. Where do we go from here? We go to a place where we treat our elections and the people who help us participate in them as sacred space, as not another fanged partisan carnival. Back away from that. We ask questions about it. We scrutinize it. Yes. But we don't treat it like just another tactical place for partisan disagreement. That's the way forward. That, and that takes leadership. That takes people who are involved in the process to not be open hypocrites, meaning you raise doubts about an election as you're campaigning, you raise doubts as votes are being counted, and then when you go ahead, suddenly bless the system as fraud-free. There are a few candidates right now who have done that exact thing. That is an open-air act of hypocrisy. It must be evaluated as such, described as such, absorbed as such. And we have to take the typical sort of rhetorical give and take in politics in which you can emphasize or de-emphasize on lots of different positions, things you used to say, things you used to believe about policy. There's a lot of give and take there. You watch it, I watch it, but not here. That treat this as the sacred space that it is. Major Garrett, David Becker, thank you so much. I hope that the great ideological <laughs> middle, as you call them, and everyone else goes out and buys your book, The Big Truth. Thank, thank you, Heidi. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this week's Afterwards podcast. If you enjoyed this podcast, listen to C-SPAN's podcast about books. Learn about the latest nonfiction books and best-selling authors. In each episode, we report on bestsellers lists and book reviews from around the country. You'll also hear authors talking about their latest books and insider interviews with nonfiction book publishing industry experts. 